Good morning, everyone. This is Marky Dean Gray with Notes and Notables, and another beautiful day here at, at Fort Lewis College, and beautiful because we have wonderful guests each week, and I ha- this week is no exception. And this gentleman has been part of our community for many, many years, has been part of Fort Lewis family for over a couple of decades, I think. We'll, we'll find out a little bit more about him. And I also want to tell you that he's sort of the man about town. He, he knows a little bit of everything that's going on here in town, and he is such an asset to, to, to Durango in Fort Lewis, and and I'm sure you all have guessed who it is immediately. It's Jim Foster. Jim, welcome. Well, it's nice to be here, Margie. It's always fun to be with you. Oh, well, you're well. We'll have some. We'll have some definite fun, Jim. One of the things I didn't mention in the very beginning is the fact that you are a the former chair of the board of the foundation board of directors. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And I have to tell everybody that Jim and I worked through this for three years. He was chair. He took over. It was only supposed to be a two-year term, but he was kind enough because we were in sort of the doldrums economically during the crash to stay on for another year, and he helped us out tremendously. And I sort of thought of him as my other husband. (laughs) Oh, my. Did did Will accept that? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I was with you more than I was with Will, actually. But anyway, so today we're going to learn a lot about you, Jim. And, I, you know, I was telling you that it would probably take me a week to go through as many questions I'd love to have you answer th- for the audience today. Uh, but we obviously don't have that much time to do. So we may have to have you coming back, well, you know, even just to hear about your trips. I'm in and out of town, but I'm here more than I'm there. You are, as a matter of fact. You know, one of the things that I love to do with our guests is to talk about how they got here. But there's a whole story behind how they got here, obviously. And, and I'd love to... to have people know a little bit more about you personally. I know you're from the Midwest. Where are you from originally? Well, I was born in Kansas City, and when I was about three months old, um, my parents moved to Des Moines. So I grew up in Des Moines, and uh, I've been pretty much an Iowan until I took off for New York. And there's, I know there's another good story where that one's concerned as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, um, I think you are probably one of the most interesting people I know. And for a number of reasons, because of your background in business. And, I mean, you have such a varied background, really. Law, political science, journalism, a little bit of everything. And you're an absolutely amazing world traveler. So we have so many things to talk about today. And I'm not even sure where to start because I know we're not going to get to all of them. So let's talk a little bit about coming from Kansas, moving to Des Moines, and your life there. Let's start off with that. Well, Des Moines was a great place to grow up. And uh, I, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I first came to Durango, I thought, you know, I like this place. It feels like Des Moines. Oh, really? You know, the people are friendly. The people are open. Uh, it, it was not the kind of uh, social climbing atmosphere that New York was. Not that I didn't enjoy that environment, too, but nevertheless, um Com- Durango just felt comfortable, like Des Moines. Mm-hmm. Well, tell me about how you started your academic career, because I know it, it sort of varied oh, yeah. a little bit more than you wanted <laughs> it to, maybe. Well, I started the State University of Iowa because I wanted to be a journalist, I thought. Mm-hmm. And um, they had a great journalism school. One, one of the, the best in the country. Four or five in Absolutely. the country. And uh, partway through my freshman year, I got in a car crash and um, broke all my ribs. Oh, and, my gosh. Uh, uh, had to be under doctor's care for a while while they put everything back together, and that meant moving back home. And so uh, I didn't want to, you know, um, abandon college at that point, so I transferred to Drake, which is in Des Moines. Mm. And Drake didn't have at that point as good a journalism school as it does now. So I said, well, the next best thing is maybe let's take political science and pre-law and see where that leads me. But uh, I'm going to go get a job at the Des Moines Register. And so I just went down and applied, got a job, um, answering s- phones in the sports department. Oh, really? Did you have to know all of the scores and everything I, else they, as the well? People called about the scores. Uh. And, and the Des Moines Register was known as both the paper Iowa depends upon and the paper Las Vegas depends upon because <laughs> it was the only major newspaper that literally literally ran every college goal oh my goodness, on, a, wow. on a Saturday. So, why why they do that? Well, because uh, there were there Iowa's always, Iowans are always interested in what's going on outside Iowa. I think that was part of it. Mm-hmm. And it was a powerful newspaper and a very good newspaper. Yeah, very so, good. Anyway, I, I uh, was sitting there one day um, rattling off scores, as people called up, and I wasn't 
looking at a cheat sheet, and the sports editor came by and said, what on earth are you doing? I, you're not looking at anything. And I said, yeah, but I know the scores now. And he said, I'm going to, uh, here are 10 scores I want to know right now. What are they? And I knew them. Oh, my goodness. And he said, we're wasting you here. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to go into the, the onto the sports desk and then uh, start covering uh, sports events for us. Do they know that you were interested in journalism, specifically in writing? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, I had probably done a little writing test or something there. Anyway, I, they immediately plunged me into it. So I didn't have to take journalism in college, and I was learning so much from being part of the Des Moines Register. There was no point in going back to Iowa, so I stayed at, uh, at the Register through my whole career in college and uh, progressed from job to job. And by the time I was in law school, I was Night City editor, and I closed up the city edition of the paper at 2 o'clock in the morning and went out and Enjoyed myself with some of the reporters and Started had about three again. hours sleep, and I was back in class the next day. Uh, How did you do that? I wouldn't try to do it now. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I, as long as once or twice a week I could sock in about 12 hours, mm -hmm. I could do it. Three hours sleep was as much as I needed. So at that, that, so that point you decided you, law was going to be where you wanted well, to go? Well, the Des Moines Register had this notion that if you were going to go to the Washington Bureau, you better have a law background because Washington's pretty much run by lawyers, and uh, it made sense. And so I was already on a political science pre-law program, and I decided, well, I'm just going to go on through law school um, and be qualified for the Washington Bureau of the Coles newspapers. And why D.C.? Uh, why D.C.? Yeah, in particular. I mean, is, was that just... Uh, well, because that's, just where, <laughs> that's where the government is mm -hmm. and the important things were going on. Although, when I got to Washington, I looked around and thought, mm, this is a big overgrown Des Moines. And by then, you know, I I started my traveling right at, after law school. I bummed around the world for two years. And, well, we're going to get into that, but let's start right this minute. All right. And, and the, So you, you finished your college degree, yeah. and you decided, I want to see the world. Yeah. I was between the Vietnam War and the, and the Korean War, and there were, they were not drafting people in Iowa uh, because f boys were coming off the farms with mechanization. And so I wasn't going to have to commit to three years in the military, so I decided, well, I'll take two years and travel. And... and had, was this something you always wanted to do, or just decided this is kind of I'm going to reward myself for having gotten through school? No, I was always curious about mm -hmm. the world. I collected stamps. I did battle maps during World War II as a little kid, and and uh, I wanted to get out there and and see it. And mm -hmm. I knew what I wanted to see, and it was everywhere. Okay, so you said it everywhere. So where did you start? Because that would be very difficult to kind of call it all down to. I went. Where you I uh, decided to go west toward Asia because I wanted to be fresh and still have enough gee whiz about traveling at that point because I knew when I got to Europe it was going to be more familiar, it was going to be easier, and I, I wanted to test myself right off the bat. So, And I decided I would not fly anywhere, even if it required, as it eventually did, getting on a camel for a long haul through the desert or rickety river boats in India and wherever. But, Unbelievable. Uh, it was all overland. So I took a ship out of San Francisco and headed for Japan. And that's where I started. So how, so did you end up ever going around the world? Oh, yeah, of okay. course. So, I mean, in, in one trip, I mean, you just, you started one place and went all yeah. the way around. So yeah. what were, you said camel, you said barge, boat, rickshaw probably. Trains. Trains. Uh, even in some places in the Middle East, taxi cabs, which were remarkably cheap mm -hmm. uh, mode of transportation between places like Damascus and Amman. And, uh, so whatever was seemed available and made sense, and uh, I met different people by traveling different modes of transportation. Mm -hmm. In India, I spent three months there. I was, they have four classes of rail travel, and I would take luxury class, I'd take first class, I'd take second class, I'd take third class. Just and experience sleep in the them. luggage racks uh, <laughs> in third class and, um, and meet people from different walks of life. So you did this all on your own? Yep. Wow, that's, that's pretty courageous. You know, well, especially going to countries it that... It seemed odd, I guess, to people at that point in time, but, you know, it, it really wasn't difficult. Mm -hmm. And when you're young and innocent and open and... <laughs> 
I mean, the, the world is there for you. And, uh, of course, Americans were a lot more popular in sure. the world in those days. Mm -hmm. It was after the war. The colonialism had been broken up pretty much, and Americans were getting a lot of credit for what was going right with the world. So having a chance to meet an American was very appealing to a lot of people. And, and then, of course, I went into places where they never expected to see a foreigner. Mm -hmm. I remember in, in the Kamayan Hills of India and in Tibet, there was no word other than literally the man from the next valley to express a foreignness. And so from the next valley to Mars, it was all the same to some oh my of these goodness. people. Yeah. So what do you think you're, you're, what do you think you learned about yourself with this travel? I mean, that really takes a lot of guts to, to do this on your own around the world. You, you know, obviously don't know all those languages. Well, I already knew I was a pretty independent soul, and I fend for myself pretty well in the world. I, was, I, I wasn't cocky about it, but I, I was confident that I could get through just about anything. And uh, um, had, you know, there were a few hair-raising moments here and there, but nothing. Can you tell us about them? Well, I got I got busted coming out of uh, China. I went in illegally past the Chinese border guards and and had to I I was intercepted on the trail by an Indian policeman on my way to the border, uh, and uh, he I I showed him my tourist introduction card, which he couldn't read, which enabled me to buy liquor in dry dry provinces if I wanted to, and. Uh, he looked at it and it looked official and he let me pass but he must have reported it because when I came back out they they grabbed me and said I was probably spying on China using area Indian territory which is not not the case they said I had a concealed camera which was in a leather case around my neck of course but never you know I, I and I even then I knew I wasn't in trouble because they held up a bus full of passengers and that I had been planning to catch and with all their animals and everything. And um, 36 hours later, they let me go, and I rode down on the rickety old bus out of the Himalayas. Well, and, and wonderful memories. Yeah, you know, They maybe memories. weren't quite as wonderful back then. They yeah. were probably a little bit scary. I wouldn't but cross now. borders illegally the way I did then. I mean, yeah. I went into China twice illegally. I went into Russia illegally. So could they have just thrown you in jail for infinitely? They could have, but again, time? you know, I was young, I was innocent. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a different world. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like today. Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, and we'll get into the so your current travel, which is you. I know you travel at least two or three times oh, internationally, three internationally during during, during the year, during the yeah. year. Back in those days, what what do you think was your favorite trip? If you look back now, what do you think was maybe I don't know because it's more unusual or the area was more beautiful. Um, what what would you consider back at the beginning? But, yeah, well, when you were traveling all by yourself. a big, wide, wonderful world to me then mm -hmm. because I had been outside the country very little until I took this trip. I'd been to Europe once and been to Canada and I'd been to Mexico, but I'd never really been out in the world. And so it was all wonderful. Uh, and there are places I've gone back to repeatedly over the years and would never get tired of. I'd never get tired of the wilder parts of Africa, never get tired of Italy. I'd never get tired of Brazil. I'd never get tired of Singapore. Mm -hmm. All busy, busy places. Oh, yeah. So you, you like the kind of the, the craziness well, of it? Well, not just that. Um, I've always had a hankering to get away from civilization at times. And 15 trips to the Amazon Whoa. while I had my career in New York, and I would plot my trips based on the population maps of uh, the Times of London and where it showed white or no population. That's where I planned to mm -hmm. go, and I would find a way in, and I'd check airline maps because I didn't want any planes flying over me, <laughs> and I would get myself back into the jungle where there was no communication, and that was really thrilling. Wow, I bet it was, absolutely. And great fishing. Yeah, and, and good. Well, we're going to get into the fishing in just a <laughs> second about because I know that's one of your, your passions for sure. Um, you know, we, I, as I said, it would take me a week to get through all the questions I would love to ask you, and so we're, we won't probably touch even a, a tiny bit of them, but um, let's get back into when you came back from your adventures, you know, around the world. What, what Had you made some decisions as to what you wanted to do? I mean, you were really pretty well versed in law and journalism and probably a million other things. I was still on a journalism track, but when uh -huh. I got back to Des Moines and settled into what was going to be, you know, a good career with the Coles newspapers, I, um, I felt constrained. I felt that 
Des Moines was half as big as when I'd left it. And then when I went to Washington, I felt it was a big overgrown Des Moines. And so I was ready when the Wall Street Journal offered me a job out of the blue. I didn't expect it. I didn't apply. It just suddenly they said, we've been looking at what you're doing and we know you can write and we'd like to have you. And we're going to start a there's an SEC investigation that's going to go on for the next two years. We want you to handle that. I said, I don't know anything about the SEC. And they said, that doesn't matter. We just, we want to hire a writer. We'll teach you about the SEC. Mm -hmm. We can't teach anybody to write, but we can teach you about the SEC. So I knew I had a job in New York, and I knew I wanted to go to New York, but I wasn't sure I wanted to do it on a journalist's salary. So I made up my mind I was going to shop around in New York before I took the Wall Street Journal job. So I never did take it. Oh, I went you didn't. to New York. Oh, I didn't I, know that. I went to two television networks. I went to two advertising agencies. I went to two PR agencies. I went to two national magazines. And I was so lucky. It was the right time. I was the right age. I had the right credentials. I got offers from all of them. So you were a boy. I settled on advertising. Mm-hmm. So before we get into the advertising, if you're just tuning in, this is w, uh, this is KDUR, and this is Notes and Notables. And my guest today is Jim Foster, who is the former chair of the Fort Lewis College Foundation, man about town, uh, I, really superstar, really superstar in oh, so many come ways. On, he, you're he's you're the superstar n- here. No, no, no. He's been involved with the community in so many different ways, not just the college, which we'll hear about, but other big um, nonprofits in this community. And he's helped all of us in one way or the other. Uh, and Jim, thank you. I just before I want to make sure that publicly I thank you for everything that you have done yeah, for the whole community. Seriously, it's, it's been a pleasure and it's it's been a privilege working with you, Margie. Well, I've learned a lot from you. I certainly have for sure. So getting back into your other life, you know. So now, I mean, I think it's amazing that you you picked two of each of. How did you decide first of all which two radio networks you were going to do and which two TV and which two you know magazines? I mean, how did you Biggest. get it down? I just went through and picked the two biggest in every category and uh, decided, you know, I'll give it a shot, see what it... And um, I, when I went to J. Walter Thompson, I told him I wanted a career in advertising. Of course, when I went to Hill and Nolan, I told him I wanted a career in public <laughs> relations. And, but it was all communications yeah, it and it was all yeah, related. Definitely. And all of the work I did with the newspaper over the course of my college career... You had the experience, for sure. It was was all excellent preparation Mm -hmm. for what I was looking for. And J. Walter Thompson, which is the biggest agency in the world, uh, said, look, um, you say you want to go into our advertising training program. We'll do that. Uh, And here's the salary level. But we've got a job in our public relations division that requires somebody just about exactly like you. And if you will take that job, we'll pay you double. Whoa. <laughs> so I said, well, that's not a hard decision, uh, yeah. but one condition, and that is that you will still train me in advertising while I'm doing that job. They said, done. So. Well, that's great. So tell us a little bit about what you did, where you sort of started with, with the company and, and where you ended up, because I know it's really quite impressive. Well, I started in the public relations division, and uh, but I then began, because of the advertising training I was getting, my accounts, I was taking over the advertising side of them as well, like mm-hmm. some of Eastman Kodak and United States Lines and you know, Blue Cross and Blue Shield and, and uh, Citibank, things wow. like that. big ones. And, um, and along somewhere in the midst of the career, um, a fellow joined J. Walter Thompson out of a corporate design firm, and we talked a lot, and we said, look, nobody – is addressing the communications needs of the corporation as opposed to the products. Everybody is, you know, immersed in the product advertising is very lucrative and everybody's doing well, but nobody is really building the reputation of the company behind the product, Mm -hmm. and that is going to become increasingly important over time. So we started very simply a separate division, and that division grew and grew, and eventually I was chairman CEO of that for about 15 years, and we had great clients, Goldman Sachs, Ford, Goodyear, United Technologies, a lot of big companies. So part of it is their whole image, in other words. Their image. So if they they were in maybe a little bit of hot water, you would be the ones to try to get it turned around? Well, we saw our job a little differently in that it was to keep them out of getting in hot water. Mm -hmm. And, And so we were always anticipating and working with them on their strategic planning, and we strategically 
set their communications goals, and then we helped them with any aspect they wanted. If it was advertising, great. If it was PR, great. If it was help with the annual report, if it was preparing the chairman to go before a congressional committee, fine. We had the capability to do those things, and so we became – our clients were – the chairman usually and CEO of the company mm-hmm. as opposed to the advertising people working with sales people and marketing people and advertising managers. We, did, we didn't do that. We went right to the top of the client organizations. So do you have any tales that you can tell us oh, well, th- that you wouldn't be shot maybe later? There were always good clients and there were well, not so good clients. Um, the, the, the good ones were the people who would really – put their trust in you. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say Goldman Sachs was one of those. John Weinberg, when he was head of it, Bob Rubin, when he was head of it, they were honorable guys, and they took the management of their reputation very, very seriously. And I was on their crisis communications committee, and so I was involved with some of the things that where they knew things were going wrong in the firm and had to be corrected. I don't know what's happening today on Wall Street. It's a very different world from when, when I was involved with, with Goldman and some of the big banks. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think people have lost track a little bit of how important and how transitory that reputa- good reputation mm-hmm. can be. But they took advice. They took advice even when they weren't quite so sure you were right, but they would trust you. Right. And as you said, that's what makes Some you- of the clients, the, the ones I'd the, <laughs> say were maybe not such great clients, were the ones who would take the work home and the recommendation home bounce it off their daughter or their wife or their sister or somebody and come back and say, no, they don't like this. And, uh, you know, and we'd have to go do something no matter what we thought really mm-hmm. was the right solution. Well, you know, that sort of leads me into how in the world did you leave New York to get here to Durango? How did you find Durango from New York? Did somebody tell you about it? How did you just happen upon it? Because you've been here, how many years now? 20? Uh, let see. I bought a house here in 92, and I became full-time pretty much in 99. Right. So it's a, a, quite a long time. Yeah. So how did you find it? I mean, you know, as I said, it's a fur I piece a from New York. I had three criteria, and I had a list of places. I had maybe 35 places on my list of possible retirement Locations. It sounds like you. <laughs> and I had uh, great fishing was number mm-hmm. one. Um, a dry climate was number two. And a college town was number three. Hmm. And so I looked around. I looked around. I was scratching a lot of places off the list and um, uh, had a client, several clients in Denver. As a matter of fact, Coors was a client and John Manville was a client. And uh, the ch- chairman of the Plus ATM Network, which was based there, said, anytime you're looking for a place in Colorado or Arizona, let me know, because I know every banker, and I'll, uh, I'll call ahead. Uh, so I had a speech in Denver, and I told, called the chap, and I said, you know, I'm going to uh, look, check out Durango this coming weekend. And so he called uh, John Marvel and Steve Parker and... Um, I had, you know, an introduction into town, and they gave me some advice about who to look for property with, and and every everything was so welcoming and friendly here. And as I, as I say, it 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 felt immediately like mm-hmm. where my roots were in Iowa. I mean, it was very very comfortable. That's great, it really is. Have you ever? Yeah, but you for a long time didn't you kind of go from one to the other? You know, I, I mean, I commuted back and yeah. forth for some time between New York and. The only thing, uh, when I arrived back in Durango, I'd have to do an attitude check, and I'd have to uh, look people in the <laughs> eye that I didn't know necessarily and say hello whether I knew them or not. And you don't do that anymore. No, no, and yeah. So that would be a treacherous path to follow. <laughs> <laughs> but it, in, in Durango, it seemed natural and comfortable. and So that was the only thing. I, I still go back and forth. I was in New York last week, and, and, and I enjoy being in New York, and I very much enjoy getting home to Durango. So you, how many times a, a year do you go to New York, do you think? Oh, probably three or four. Mm-hmm. So you really do, so you keep in touch with the people you knew back there? and I do my a lot of shopping there because I know mm-hmm. where everything is. And, the Metropolitan. Uh, and well, yes, you know, I no longer have a box at the Metropolitan <laughs> Opera, but I I did remember the Guild, so I go there. Of course, now the Metropolitan Absolutely. is right here at Fort Lewis, live in HD. And uh, so, what do you think of that in comparison, knowing that you are such a connoisseur? It's a different medium. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get backstage, you get the interviews, you get to know the artists a little better, and find out what ex- 
extraordinarily bright and capable and talented people. They are much more than when you see them mm-hmm. on stage. Uh, and so that's a dimension you don't get when you're in the hall. The right. only difference and the only advantage to being in the hall is live sound is not truly reproducible. Mm-hmm. There is something about that live sound in the hall that is uh, much more penetrating than hearing it on a you know, perfectly good this is a state-of-the-art speaker system here at the Fort Lewis Student Union, and uh, it meets all the Met standards. It's as good as you're going to hear anywhere in the country, but it isn't live. Yeah, I mean, there is a difference between the color, the he- hearing those voices, seeing the, the, the interactions, but being there, is, it is yeah, very different. But, you're but, right. You know, but with is... a live in HD, you're get, you're. Yeah. You're zooming in for close-ups, and Plus, you really are right there in their face. Plus, I think the wonderful thing about having it here is that you do see behind the scenes, as you said, where you yeah. wouldn't get that normally. And so yeah. you get a, another sense of the individual you yeah. know, being able to do that. Well, let me go into a couple of things because we're going to have to cl- close in about five minutes. Which, oh, boy. And I know, and I haven't gotten half, I know, and I haven't gotten halfway through with all the things that I really wanted to talk with you about. Um, you have, as I mentioned when I first started, you've just been a wonderful asset to this college. You helped us through some really tough times when the, the market crashed in, in uh, 08, and we, the foundation could not have gotten through really uh, without you. We were so fortunate that you had the interest, the passion to help us, seriously, because everything went underwater, as you well know, and then we had to bring it back up. And we were, I think, if, if not the first college in Colorado, pretty doggone close to one of the first to really get all of everything back, back above where it was. I think we were the first one to get all of our funds back above water, endowed funds, you mm-hmm. know, that were yeah. really below their historic levels. And we did we did that, I think, ahead of every other mm-hmm. college. So thank you for doing Colorado. that. Well, you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And <laughs> uh, we had some streak of good luck there. We, we sold some property. Uh, that had been given to the college many, many years before that it appreciated, and we had a large gift in there. And, mm-hmm. But, um, you know, everybody uh, knuckled down and worked very hard, and, and we did pull out a lot sooner than most people pulled right. out. Well, you know, I, I talked about that you've been involved with other organizations around the community, and, and I don't want to get into that. I would love to get into it, but I unfortunately don't have time for it. So when did you really get involved with Fort Lewis, and what, what was one of the first things you did to kind of get yourself involved? Oh, I think about the first three or four weeks I was here, I was at a dinner party, and Joel Jones was there. And he asked a few questions, and, well, would you like to get involved with this, that, or the other thing at the college? And I got involved with several committees up at the college and then eventually went on the foundation board and uh, the rest is chairman history. at just the worst possible yeah, time, I, I guess, 2008 when yeah. everything was going haywire. Yeah. But um, it was it was challenging and, and, you know, I'm getting up in years, but I still want a fresh challenge every day. Well, I will tell you, everybody who's listening, this guy has more energy than just about anybody I know. He could run circles around everybody and uh and and and, but he continues to give of himself which i think is so special of you uh, jim because um a lot of people don't and uh, you've given a a tremendous amount emotionally financially and spiritually to to the college but you have to a lot of other nonprofits in this community and that says a lot about you and the one thing that jim kind of at the time poo-pooed which is i want to just kind of punch him for a little bit is uh, about what three years ago he you won citizen of the year no, volunteer, volunteer, of the, volunteer year. of the year for yeah. the chamber. And I sit on the committee that makes those decisions. And he said, oh, well, you know, anybody can get that. Well, you know, anybody can't get that. And I know how important it is. And you are just the perfect example of somebody who is selfless and, uh, and going out and helping others in their community and making a real difference. Well, I, I just think the people who don't use what they can do are wasting it. And it's the old use it or lose it. So... Uh, I think that as you get up in years, if you've got certain things you can do, you should do it. Well, do you have any advice for the the people out there listening? Uh, you know, just uh, all the things that you have done in your career. Th- oh, for young people, I would say, you know, just be sure you always have a goal. Mm-hmm. Whatever's in front of it doesn't mean you can't change the goal. I mean, I did some goal changing, but I always had a goal, and then I put all my energy against achieving it. And the other thing is to follow your passions. Do what you enjoy doing. You're never going to be successful if you're doing something that you aren't relishing Mm -hmm. doing. And I've always been doing things that I really relish doing. 
Well, one of the things that I want to end on is, and Jim has been willing to, to he'll be willing to do this with me, is I want I want to write a children's book. And uh, Jim had told me about his adventures when he was going from place to place to place on camel and barge and a little bit of everything. And, and one of his adventures, he lost his suitcase, and it just ended up, I mean, literally going all around the world all by itself. And so I'm going to be doing a, a children's story, and I'll be writing it, and, and Jim's going to be my... Uh, advisor going well, through this. My suitcase. Will, your suitcase. Uh, <laughs> so I'll have to have a picture of the suitcase on, <laughs> on the flap or something like that. But I just want to thank you again for joining me today. And it's uh, wonderful having you here. And I hope you will continue. One of the things we didn't have a chance to mention, but I want to congratulate you, Jim, is that he is currently the chair of the board for the Rocky Mountain PBS in Denver. And what a, a wonderful accolade to you because you, I mean, that's a pretty big deal. Pretty well, big it's deal. It's fun being here today, and I, I always enjoy being with you, Marty. Well, you thank you. I, well, I appreciate it as well. So, everybody, have a wonderful weekend, and thanks for joining us today. And I hope that you'll stay tuned next week and uh, have a lovely, lovely time. Thanks so much. Bye bye.